Hi, Alex Ackerman here, one of the pastors at the Longmont Vineyard. Welcome to our 14-week series, How to Become Fully Human. These set of talks are based on Matthew 5-7, through 7, Sermon on the Mount. How would you like to become more human? This is the Greek letter theta. It's the first letter in the Greek word for God, theos. I'll be using it to represent God throughout this animation. Even though this letter looks quite alone, he's actually already a vibrant community, all in himself, known as the Trinity. Three of them, actually, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're best friends from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time. And oh, they're good. A good father giving good gifts to us human beings. Isn't that great? What could possibly mess up a sweet arrangement like this? Well, we could. We had to make it on our own. We had to do it our own way and split off from that awesome community. And we started our own community, a counter community. This move, separating from God, actually greatly diminished the core of ourselves, our very humanness. We did succeed in creating our own world apart from God, but it wasn't and isn't such a great place. We found that apart from the ultimate community, we began to die. And worse yet, we started killing each other. We didn't know it, but our breaking of the partnership with God brought forth a new partnership partnership with evil. This brought a response from the heavenly community commonly called the wrath of God, his way of opposing our new world, toxic, poisoning, killing each other off, with the hope of eventually freeing us from it if we wanted. This is where Jesus comes in in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about a new way to live, his way. You could say that this new life was introduced in the sermon. Life begins here. These three chapters in Matthew are a beautiful description of that life, both the way in, open to all people, blessed are all, and what it would look like. He warns us not many will actually choose choose his path, but boy, those who do, they will live the life, all because of his coming to earth, which was already announced by him as he showed up, called the incarnation, and because of something that would happen a few years later on. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Jesus begins by talking about what exactly it is in our new world that's so screwed up and that the old way of dealing with it, namely hypocrisy and pretension, won't cut it anymore. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, you get it. But it wasn't about trying harder and pretending more, but about changing on the inside through interaction with him. So he gets to the root of our problems. The first thing he discusses is murder. Don't think you have a problem with that? Well, you do if you're angry, and we're all angry. We don't get what we want, and so we get mad. And speaking about what you do want, that's our second big problem. Desire, or more specifically, toxic desire. Don't take this wrong. God wants to meet our desires. Remember, good father, good gifts. But it's when we seek our pleasure for our own sake, apart from God and often opposed to other people, that's when things go bad. Jesus starts talking about our oaths, or to put it another way, the way our mouths express the anger and the toxic desire we're so consumed by. The problem is our mouths. So we use our mouths in anger, words of contempt, calling people things, you know, like when you're driving on the highway. Since we're not expecting God to give us what we need and truly desire, we figure out that we'll use our mouths to get that too. That's called lying or manipulation. Know anybody like that? Well, we all do it, and we all do it to each other. Basically, our anger gets our mouths saying stuff, and we start hurting people in lots of ways. So they retaliate. Or perhaps they're not wanting the consequences of open retaliation, so they just hold on to bitter offenses and perhaps find more subtle ways of getting back at each other. Passive aggressive. Basically, this is the mess we call planet Earth. It's led to immeasurable suffering, world wars, genocides, pandemics. Well, you get the idea. Look at this picture. Does it describe humanity? Does it describe you? Awkward. Well, Jesus isn't just wanting to tell us the hard truth. He was willing to do something about it. And now we're back to his talk and his presence on the planet and his crucifixion and resurrection. Boom! 
That event, kind of like a big bang of creative power, was launching us out of the screwed up world and into a new one. A new one. Well, you may be thinking I'm talking about heaven, right? The next world after we die? No. Well, yes and no. It's about entering the kingdom of heaven now and how to live that kingdom life here on the earth and into eternity. At the end of the message, he basically says if you're not living the life now, then you're like a tree without fruit, uprooted, dried out, and thrown away into the, well, you get the idea. Enough of the bad news. After all, Jesus came to give us life. So let's see what he says about that life, his life. He gives us three ways to live, three secrets, three secret practices that though they are not to be flaunted, can only be fulfilled in the context of community, in the kind of community he wanted for us in the first place. And it can't be for impressing other people or even trying to get God to be happy with you. Good father, good gifts, remember? It's really about taking that love that he's giving us and keeping it alive by passing it along, being salty, being shiny. Here are the three secrets to living on the path, living in the way of Jesus. First secret, giving. You mean like money? Yes. To whom? Well, the poor. But won't that mean I have less money? Of course. But if you want to continue receiving the love of the Lord, give it away. If you want to keep getting good gifts from the good Father, then pass them along. It only works if it's love expressed and if you do it in secret. It's not people impressed, but love expressed. Next secret, prayer. Not for people to see, not in some kind of Guinness Book of World Records word marathon, but in private, looking for a reward for the one who sees you. This one is also love expressed because you're conversing with the one who loves you and loves your soul and taking the time to let him love you back. If this sort of prayer is what you're doing, then it's not hard work at all, is it? It's friendship. It's joining in the ultimate community. Final secret, fasting. Fasting? What? Who does that anymore? Well, let me back up here for a minute. We're not talking about 21st century consumer Christianity anymore. We're talking about actual life, discipleship, apprenticeship. But can I just be a believer and not an apprentice? Jesus doesn't delineate between those two words, just between real followers and fake ones, talkers versus doers. So why the fasting? How will that help? Think about it this way. We've been rescued from the old, dark world, and in the new world, we're gradually going into the light. Now, we can speed that up by disconnecting from the old world and better connecting to the new. That's on us, not anyone else. Fasting, and I'm talking about 2,000 years of people following Jesus, does this better than anything else. If it's love expressed and paired with being generous to the poor and friendship with Jesus, then it's the best. So get fasting, start with something and work your way up. Also a great way to lose weight. Still with me? I hope so, because now Jesus talks about the net changes we get from the three secret acts of followership, the three freedoms gained, the payoff. First, we're not all caught up in our possessions anymore, which is nice because a lot of us feel like we have to work really, really hard all the time just to keep up. After all, if we don't provide for ourselves, who will? Good father, good gifts. So maybe lighten up and rest some. The Bible calls this Sabbath, the idea that I can let up and God will fill in. In fact, he provides the whole time. Second freedom, freedom from worry. Well, we all want that. Here's the idea. We stop hurting each other because we're mad and not getting what we want apart from God in our own world. And instead, we simply ask. We simply ask him in prayer, the pinnacle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we trust him by being generous with what we do have. Then we learn how not to worry. We find out he does provide for us. The third freedom as we walk this walk is freedom from judging or judgment. You know, the speck in your brother's eye versus the log in your own, judgment. Isn't it odd that Christians are considered to be the most judgmental people in the world? And the worst tippers, by the way. Perhaps it's because we've embraced this high set of standards and they don't like that, or more likely because we're still doing it the old way trying to live up to these impossible standards, behavior modification, outward appearances. And boy, does that put Johnny in a bad mood. We don't get it that Jesus is actually turning us into that person. We can't do it the way of the scribes and the Pharisees anymore or put those burdens on others. 
We're not under the microscope here. We're already in. Heavenly Father, good Father, good gifts, accepted, a part of the divine community already. No need to carry those burdens or put them on others. Freedom from judging or fault finding, trying to fix those we love by nitpicking and tinkering with them, but just telling them the truth in love, fully aware that it's Jesus who's making us into the person that he's created us to be. Thankful that he's created a process for that. Well, there you have it. Jesus' description of the new life, powered by him, but worked through by us. A beautiful partnership of love, not a tough to live up to religion. The life, fully human. Join us here at the Longmont Vineyard for these 14 weeks, a worshiping community where life begins here.